So without, without further ado, I'll pass it over to Albert to introduce himself. Okay, yeah. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, just to reinforce what Jean has said, uh, we're thrilled to be asked to do this and uh, <coughs> it'll help us reach out to uh, a larger audience, we hope, uh, to attract even more people to Curon. Um, assessing, uh, I'm currently a Professor Emeritus in Management at St. Mary's University. Um, I'm the co-chair of the International Critical Management Studies Association. Um, my research interests are pretty much the same as Gene. Somewhere after so many years, our research melds into each other. Um, but I'll repeat my list, uh, gender at work, diversity, intersectionality, historiography, and critical sense-making. These are my uh, current interests. And the reason we are doing this and giving you this information is we want the audience to understand who, who are the people behind the editing process, ourselves and the associate editors, and what our interests are. And this might sort of give you some greater clues, more subtle clues as to what we're looking for. Thank you. Now, Gina, okay. that's where we are. Right, I was just unmuting myself. So um, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the journal, Qualitative Research in Organizations and Management, it's an international journal. It's um, committed to encouraging and publishing critical qualitative work from both researchers and practitioners within the management and organizational field throughout the world. So we're here to explain what we are and we're here to encourage you, we hope by the end of this session, to, to submit to us. And Jean, I think at this point we introduce our AEs. No, um, we go through the, the central issues of the research. So we'll go through the PowerPoints first. Okay. okay. <laughs> um, that's what happens when you've been together for so long. So the two central issues that we look at with the journal are obviously qualitative research from the name and a critical focus um, is imperative for the research. So we can, we can take it to the next, okay, thanks. So basically what we're looking for are articles that provide us with an in-depth study of the processes involved so for example, what activities or interrelationships can be identified in arriving at a particular conclusion when you're submitting, when you're submitting your article or a discussion or a reflection on issues of research practice. So for example, what can we learn from applying selective qualitative methods? We're also looking on uh, for articles that are focused on subjective experiences, ones that provide us with in-depth understanding of what people feel about the processes involved. And I should say, we're, we're going through these quickly and we'll entertain any questions you have on these as we, as we go along in the next session. Okay, so, okay. Um, we are also looking for papers that are context oriented. That is that they provide us with an understanding of the context in which the study is being conducted and the potential influence on the people under the study. So that, that is um, the critical element, I would say, right there. Um, we're looking for papers that provide an in-depth account of key aspects of the, obviously, qualitative research applied and the challenges that are involved. So for example, what methods were used, how and why were they used, and what lessons are to be learned from adopting a particular research strategy? Albert, you're back. Did you want to add anything to these? Or should we wait till we get the questions? <clears throat> yeah, let's perhaps wait till we get the questions. Okay, so we can go to the, the last um, overhead. Okay, um, so we can't emphasize the critical focus enough. Um, we're looking for papers, obviously, that are critical. And I would say that this is the uh, probably the major 
uh, reason that we would reject papers when we get them if there isn't a critical element to them. So we're looking for papers that broadly are concerned with understanding the impact of management and organizing both on human experience and life chances. So without further ado, that gives you a brief overview of what the objectives of the um, journal are. And Albert, you can take it over from here with the introductions. Um, we have a lot of our AEs here today, but um, we also have heard from a lot of them who have given us some, some quotes. So I will let Albert take over at this stage with either the introductions or the quotes. Yeah, <clears throat> excuse me. What we've, can you hear me? Yeah. What we've asked our uh, AEs to do uh, is to briefly introduce themselves and to tell us what QROM means for them. And again, the audience gets insights into who are behind these decisions. So I'm, I'm, I have a list of who's here. So I call on you one by one, just to briefly say who you are, obviously, and what QROM means to you. Uh, can I start with Paulina? Of course. Hi, everyone. Good morning. It's great to be here. Um, my name is Paulina Segarra. I am an assistant professor at Universidad Anahuac, Mexico. And my research interests are very, very broad, as you know, as of many other colleagues in the CMS community. So I'm interested in the immigrant experience, leadership, academic well being, corporeality, of course, qualitative studies. And I've also focused in the banality of evil and other Arendtian concepts. And it's fantastic to be here. Thank you, Albert. Thanks, Paulina. Uh, and now we go to Brazil for Amon. Latin America rules. <laughs> Just kidding. So my name is Amon Barros. I am an assistant professor at FGV in Sao Paulo. Uh, I'm also a member of the executive committee uh, for the US AOM. CMS division, so the CMS division of the American Academy of Management, uh, with Paulina Segarra and others here. Uh, my research focuses on critical management and organizational history mainly, but also I've been doing some uh, new research on business and society with more contemporary stuff. Uh, in my research, I mainly use documents uh, and news stories, so qualitative uh, uh, written materials. Uh, which I analyze using uh, regular uh, qualitative uh, data uh, thinking, but, but, I, but I think this is important, reflexively how I build the data that I gather. So uh, putting the, the researcher as a, a, an agent in building uh, it's, uh, their data set. So I guess this is important for Kiorain because it's a reflexive journal. Right, thanks, Amon. Um, more locally, uh, Kristen? Good morning. So my name is Kristen Williams, and I am a visiting scholar at the University of Eastern Finland, and I'm the historian in residence at Dalhousie University, along with my some of my colleagues here. I'm a member of the CMS executive um, and uh, as part of uh, the Academy of Management, I'm also an associate editor uh, at Culture and Organization, and my interests are distinctly feminist. I consider myself to be a feminist polemicist, and I am interested in activist writing, writing differently, um, incorporating fictional techniques, uh, working in, in a historical context, and, and um, I love autoethnography. Uh, so that's a little bit about me in terms of um, what QRA means to me. It's actually the first place that I published uh, a solo article. So I have a um, a, a special place in my heart for for it giving me confidence around my my own writing and and uh, working with Jean and Albert over these last many years has been a great honor. So thank you. Thanks, Kristen. And now to the Netherlands for Inga. Mm -hmm. 
Hello, my name is uh, Inge Blijenberg and I'm calling in from the Netherlands where it's raining really hard, so you may even hear that. I'm Associate Professor of Research Methods at uh, Radboud University. I am specialized in action research and qualitative research methods. I do a lot of research on gender diversity and intersectionality. What I like about Q, uh, CROM, as I now hear you uh, call it, is the critical approach and the deep reflection upon how we get to knowledge. So like what, net, what methods we use, how we use them, how this influences the knowledge that we derive. And I like to work with uh, grassroots knowledge generation, so co-creation of knowledge with groups that may normally not be involved in uh, knowledge development. And what I like about the typical paper that people submit to this journal is uh, that it gives a good description of how the, the, the knowledge is derived and that it reflects very consciously with the correct methodological use of literature about yeah, how the way the knowledge was derived influences the outcomes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, going to the US for talk to Raza. Hi. Uh, my name is Reza Amir, and I teach uh, at William Patterson University in New Jersey. I've uh, been associated with QROM for a very long time uh, as an associate editor, but also as an author who has published there. And I am very, very proud to be part of the community both ways. Uh, in my uh, uh, dissertation research, I used ethnographic techniques. And at that time, I remember that uh, when I was trying to get my work published. I had the toughest time explaining to uh, reviewers who thought that I was doing a case study uh, because they really could not understand uh, that there are certain clear epistemological traditions that we follow uh, that inform the methodology of our research. That is what I love about Curon, that you don't really have to start the conversation at that basic level. Uh, so people understand your methodology. They really promote uh, reflexivity as well as uh, the ability to engage with other disciplines than our own. So if you are uh, half trained to be a sociologist or an anthropologist, then I think your work will be very welcome here. And I really look forward to uh, getting as many uh, articles as possible, as many submissions as possible, particularly from early career researchers and even doctoral students. We are very receptive and friendly to that kind of work as well. Thank you. Thanks, Raza. And back to, uh, or to the UK, Satvi. Hi, everyone. Really lovely to uh, see so many folks here and um, really honored to be part of um, QROM and um, its editorship. I, uh, some of my interests, or I should say I'm at, based at Queen Mary, uh, University of London in the UK, and my interests are ethnography primarily, but also experimental methods. Um, and I think this goes back to my interest in interdisciplinarity, um, sort of, I think, criticality for management studies is very much about breaching those disciplinary boundaries and to actually make dialogue and conversation with folks in the broader social sciences and humanities. Um, and so part of my interest and my deep respect for QROM is how it enables us to actually breach those boundaries very critically, very reflexively and intentionally. Um, and I'm really interested in looking at how interdisciplinarity sort of has an impact on the kind of methodologies we use um, and how methodology is in fact a central component of what we do as a researcher. Um, so I think it's an incredibly important um, aspect of our work and also what we can think about. I'm inspired by post-colonial theory, um, decolonial theory, Chicana feminism and black feminism uh, particularly. And um, the role I see um, as an AE is to work developmentally. So not to put harsh question marks and, you know, capitalize letters, but actually to work with the, with the authors and to really think about, well, how do we develop a conversation with each other that stretches and really 
um, um, draws out the potential of the work being submitted. And I'll, I'll end there. Well, thanks, Sophie. Uh, back to the USA and David. Good morning, good afternoon. Uh, all across the world, it's great to be here. It's very much, it's a great thing to be part of this group talking about this journal, which is innovative and very significant in terms of the breadth of approaches to knowledge that are present within it. Uh, I think that people who do work for QROM are craftspeople in research. They don't merely employ a single tool, but they look at, a, at pieces of evidence and begin to reason about them from that kind of integrative perspective. So uh, I think that the, the world becomes much more transparent when we abandon our preconceptions and methodologies that lead us to be so narrow in our focus. In my own research experience, I found myself struggling so often uh, against uh, the narrow framework of methodologies imposed by a journal or even by my dissertation committee. I found that by imposing neoclassical analysis or something similar in a particular discipline, uh, there was a narrowing of vision and obscuring of what's important. In my own thinking, I've been trying to make sense of the very bizarre context of American political systems. We, we have one country, we think, but really it's 50 or more different countries that are very much influenced by their history of slavery and servitude. We can't make sense of the reality if we don't look at individual case studies and institutions and begin to process them as thinkers, as craftspeople. As I think I might've mentioned, I'm at American University in DC, uh, which in, it's, I'm still in a business school. I've always been in the margins, but QROM is one of the important institutions that leave me space outside the margins so I can think without feeling wholly encroached upon by more traditional structures. So thank you very much for that. And thank you very much for being with you this morning, afternoon, evening. Thanks, David. We go back to Halifax local time, Amy. Hi, I'm Amy Thurlow and uh, I'm at Mount St. Vincent University in Halifax. Um, I'm professor of communication and I'm also a department chair of the, the Department of Communication Studies in Halifax. Um, my research interests are in communication management and identity construction primarily um, and uh, critical sense making and historiography um, are, are sort of the, the method or approaches that I, I'm very interested in using. And what QROM uh, means to me, it, it really is a great experience for me to be an AE on this on this journal because I work with such a wonderful group of colleagues and many of them have already covered some of the, thing, the things that are so important um, about this journal. The first thing that comes to mind for me is that it creates space for really important research in such a crowded field um, of academic scholarship and publishing and it creates opportunities for things like interdisciplinary approaches and critical approaches, which otherwise would be marginalized in sort of the, the, the mainstream flow of, of information. Um, and I, and I want to emphasize the point, this is this has already come up, I know, it, from a couple of the AEs, but the feeling at QROM really is uh, supportive and developmental. And we really do um, look at submissions uh, from the perspective of how, how can we uh, make this better? How can we help uh, make this piece better and and take that developmental approach. Thank you. Thanks, Amy. And finally, um, Chris. Hi, I'm Chris Hart. I'm an associate professor at Dalhousie University. I work in the Faculty of Agriculture. And so I often say I teach business to farmers. Uh, I'm currently acting as chair of my department too, so it's, it's making my day quite busy, um, especially when that job is foisted upon you two days into the term. At any, at any rate, my interests uh, research-wise are primarily around actor network theory and critical sense making. And I uh, started my work with Albert and Jean as a dissatisfied positivist, I think I'd say and uh, got introduced to, be, to being a post-positivist through them. So I originally worked with archival material and I, it occurred to me that it would be interesting to see if the techniques that we use with archival material 
would also work with social media material, same sorts of, you know, velocity and, and volumes of, of uh, data. So I've been trying that for the last uh, five or six years. I do work in agriculture with grad students who want to study such things as beef and dairy and stuff like that. Um, so I try to be a little insidious and, and get these very positivist colleagues of mine to start thinking about how positivism doesn't work and inject some of our critical ideas into, into the work that we do, not just with my own students, but with other uh, colleagues. So that's fun. I really enjoy my time with QROM. One, one thing that it does is it exposes me to uh, methods and ideas that I'm not as familiar with. And uh, because people always come up with new ways to do things. And it helps keep me grounded when uh, on a regular day, I'm talking to someone who wants to increase the amount of milk their cow produces. Thanks. Okay. All right. Thanks, Chris. <coughs> We're going to the questions in a second or two. But uh, first, I'm going to ask Kristen to just give us a brief account of behind the scenes. It'd be my pleasure to do that. So um, for two years, I served as editorial assistant, which is now a position that's occupied by Nicholas Deal, and he's doing a spectacular job. But just to give you some insight as to the mystery behind what it's like to submit a manuscript and what actually happens when you do this, we use a system called Scholar One Manuscript Central, which is actually a system that's used by by many journals and, and some of you might be very familiar with it. It can be a little intimidating, um, but you know, even if you're not submitting a manuscript, I would encourage you to go in and create a profile within QROM, um, identifying yourself potentially even as a reviewer. Um, and you'll save yourself some time because you'll already have a profile in there when you get around to submitting um, a manuscript. When a manuscript comes in to us, it's, it's um, given directly to, to Albert and Jean, and, and they are tasked with the decision of, of figuring out whether or not it meets the criteria of the journal. Again, these are the characteristics of being distinct, uh, distinctly uh, critical in nature, innovatively qualitative, um, and, and offering a unique and interesting context. And if it meets those uh, criteria, it's, it's typically uh, then sent off to one of our, our AEs. Um, we did a pretty thorough sort of, um, I, don't, I don't know what else to call it, other than a talent matrix of our associate editors in the areas that, that they're interested in and, and have expertise to offer. And we try to ensure that the assignments that they receive are um, a really strong fit. Um, with their own expertise. And um, this is not to say that, that when uh, an article then comes to them that they don't also then have the authority to, to potentially reject uh, um, a paper at that time. There are moments where we have these papers that come in that seem to have tremendous potential but just need a little bit more work. And, and that's when um, I'm usually recruited, in this case, deal, uh, Nick is recruited for some sober third voice um, to try to understand whether or not we should advance this paper for, um, for review. And um, it just means that the paper is, is, is a difficult decision. Um, but what I think people need to know who are making submissions to QRAM is that we are, as many of our AEs have said, um, very developmental in our approach. We're really on the side of the authors. And if we see great potential, uh, we will um, advance it on uh, for, for potential development. And I think if you, if you in, are in a situation where you're an author and you've submitted and, and you've been assigned to an associate editor, and that associate editor has then decided to send it on for blind peer review. Um, you need to, to understand that, that, that an investment has been made in you as an author by QROM. We are, we are committed to help you develop that paper. And that's a very positive experience. So you should be very excited about that. Um, because now really the work ahead is, is, is you know, meeting um, the questions and, and critiques that come by way of peer review, which is just the reasonable process we all go through in terms of developing a paper. Uh, so I think that um, one of the things I wanted to get across in this session was to demystify that a little bit 
Um, it is a process. You have to have faith in the process. Um, and I know it's difficult to get uh, critique. It's difficult for all of us. And I think what's difficult, particularly in the context of QRAM, is that much of the work that we see is, is very personal. Um, you know, there's a great deal of personal investment made, um, lots of first voice, lots of uh, reflexivity. So, you know, when it comes along to peer review, it can feel even a little bit more um, cutting, if you will. Um, but I have had some um, terrific experiences. Our AEs are extremely approachable. If there's something that you don't understand, um, if you have some um, different uh, opinions that have been given you by reviewers and you're trying to navigate how to best move forward, I would encourage you to reach out to your um, associate editor and ask for some direction and some, and some support in that. I have done that in the past. I've even gotten on the phone with an associate editor and talked through a strategy about how to move the paper forward. Um, so I'll leave it there. Hopefully I, I've covered off what you wanted me to, Albert and Jean. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to uh, provide some back of house information. Thanks, Kristen. Um, so we I see we have like questions in the uh, yeah. We'd like to open it now to questions, and be, so, feel free to address the panel or anybody on the panel or us. Okay, I see we have the first question, so I'll read it out and. Uh, we can take it from there. Uh, from Allison, I'm a PhD student in management. My research is at the intersection of gender, economic sociology, and the sociology of work. And I innately want to research with a feminist and critical approach. My advisors are not critical qualitative scholars. How do you advise that I develop the skills and experience to publish a critical qualitative paper? So, is there anyone who wants to answer that, or shall we proceed? I, I, I can try because I like the question a lot. Okay. Um, and I would approach this process as a learning process for you and your supervisors. There's a big advantage in supervisors not being like trained in this critical thinking. You can involve them in your thinking process by explaining every step why you want to approach this subject critically, um, which authors inform you in that and how. And as soon as you're able to convince them, you can probably convince any audience. So uh, try to see it as an advantage rather than as something that will hinder you as soon as long as they are open for your development and for you to persuade them it may help you to put things on paper and make every thinking step explicit and i enjoy very much your subjects thank you can i add something to that yes go ahead that is Thank you. If that was a very good uh, comment, thank you very much. I think that if you look at your research as kind of a an object that fits in a variety of holes, probably following your supervisors according to their direction to some degree. So keep it in one mode in that orientation. Take a piece of it, submit it to a traditional journal. At the same time, rotate your research put it in another shape, begin to submit it to a qualitative, to a critical journal, and learn from the process of discussion with the journal. You'll then become kind of ambidextrous working in two different traditions and making progress and getting stuff published. Thank you. Gina, I, I wanted to, it's Chris, I wanted to add in that, you know, things like uh, coming to this session and maybe the uh, Inter International Doctoral Consortium that was hosted in Mexico last uh, spring, uh, things like that, uh, going to conferences and participating in the CMS stream so you meet other people because, you know, one of the things in the question here is developing the skills and experience. And if you're not getting the training within your program, to work in, you know, critical feminism, then, you know, you need to find the people that you can talk to about that. It's one thing to read or look at PowerPoints or watch YouTube videos, but it's a whole other thing to actually talk to people, you know, um, like the people that are here today, 
about what you want to do. The other caveat would be, you know, I, I mentioned earlier, I work mostly with positivists in, in my life and sometimes they're not very accepting of people doing other types of work. Uh, if, you're, if your supervisors are not accepting of the idea of you doing critical work, then that could be a, a problem, you know. Uh, we're all, we all know the adage about what, what's a good dissertation. So you have to make sure you're working toward that outcome. Okay, do we have another question? We do have another question from Sri. Permission to discuss. You have permission. Uh, qualitative, <laughs> sorry, Albert? No. I didn't say uh, anything. Oh, okay. Um, hang on. Qualitative research, this is what we're discussing, means personal opinion based on self observation with references. Question mark. Discuss. I think Albert, that is a, a good question for you to start. You're gonna have to repeat it. <laughs> okay, um, the discussion point is qualitative research means personal opinion based on self-observation with references. So I think the question is saying, is that what qualitative research means? No, I, I mean, if I've understood the question, um, there's a lot of critique of qualitative research as being um, just somebody's opinion, uh, which is, to be honest, very, very annoying because one of the, I don't want to put the audience off here, but one of the, the very difficult things is to sort of master qualitative research and to understand a different um, different ways of gathering data and different ways of ensuring that what we collect is plausible and convincing to certain audiences. It's that plausibility, um, but it's also in, in quantitative research that has to be plausible, but they use other words, they use other words. Um, in qualitative research, as David said earlier in this, this webinar, qualitative research is a craft and you're developing all these skills. If, if qualitative research was just about opinion, we wouldn't have a field of, of inquiry. Uh, people would just write anything and it would be seen as acceptable. Well, we don't, I'm gonna use a positive term here. We invest rigor in our research. We don't want to push out stuff that's just an opinion. We want to back up that opinion with examples, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So that touches a little bit of what I react to that question. May, may I uh, respond a little more? Uh, because uh, I actually explored this question uh, a little bit in an article that I wrote for Curom. And uh, what what I say might uh, be a little basic, and as they say in the United States, 101 for uh, some of you, but at the risk of uh, reiterating a few things that everybody knows uh, for the sake of those who might be beginners, because this sort of a question seems to have been posed by somebody who's early in their career. Now, the distinction between qualitative and quantitative research is an artificial one. It is a one that we did not choose. It was foisted upon us. We think of ourselves in terms of our philosophical approaches, in terms of our uh, uh, you know, political positions, and in terms of, as Albert said, the craft that we use to reach counterintuitive conclusions. It is called qualitative research by others because there was a binary that was created sometime around the 19th, late uh, 19th, early 20th century uh, between qualitative and quantitative research. Quantitative research is associated usually with uh, the deployment of statistical analysis. So anything that doesn't use statistical analysis comes our way. And we don't identify as qualitative researchers per se. 
we identify ourselves as reflexive interpretive researchers who use a variety of methods that come under this uh, group. Think of yourself as a musician. So somebody might be a jazz musician. Somebody else might, uh, you know, play classical music. Somebody else might have, uh, you know, rhythm and blues. But each one of those traditions has their own standards. And within that, people working with, within that know what is good and what is bad music. Similarly, we clearly know what is good research and what is bad research. We do not generalize from, uh, from ungeneralizable things. Uh, we, don't, uh, we don't accept any of the parameters that might be foisted upon us by quantitative researchers, such as reliability or validity, but that does not mean we don't have our standards and we will definitely uh, not accept uh, poor quality research uh, just because it is quote unquote qualitative. Thank you. Thanks, Raza. And for those of you who want to follow up, uh, Raza uh, did write this excellent article on this uh, for an earlier issue of Curon. I think we. we May I add a quick comment? Oh, what is the best paper? Sorry? May I add a quick comment? Uh, Follow Absolutely. Me. So yeah. I guess uh, for me, the thing is uh, in qualitative research, or at least the type of qualitative research we invite at QRM, uh, the research recognizes themselves as implicated in the production of the research, because there is this, uh, uh, let's say, fantasy of the neutral researcher that produces or just analyzes the data, doesn't produce the data. And I guess what we invite people to recognize, as, as, as uh, Raza said, is that researcher, researchers are reflexively interpreting the data they are using to produce uh, their findings, uh, be that be their, 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 their data they are using qualitative or quantitative. But here we invite researchers to recognize themselves as agents in the process of producing and interpreting the data, not, not to hiding themselves behind some fantasy of neutrality or something like that. So that's why I guess some people uh, often uh, 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 think uh, of, of political research as a uh, personal opinion. I guess that's a, a mistake in a sense, because we are, it's not like personal opinions, it's recognizing that the researcher is always there in the research. Albert, I wanted to build off of what Eamon said and, and frame it in the context of the journal. So as an associate editor, when I get assigned a paper, one of the things I always look for is demonstration of reflexivity in, in the writing. Uh, and that's definitely going to be one of the things that if it's not there is insufficient, I'm going to be looking for in revisions. Uh, and so that from a practical perspective, it's, it's a requirement to be published, uh, at least in my, in my head. And uh, it's, it's the key thing that separates it out. I work with positivists, you know, quali quantitative researchers all the time. And I ask them the same question because often quantitative research is finding the math that supports your opinion. Thanks, I, would, um, I would just add, if I may, just quickly that, um, this conversation has brought up an important point for um, distinguishing what, what generally gets accepted to be put on for review and what doesn't. So we often do see qualitative submissions um, that are rather descriptive and, and don't offer a critical perspective, do not offer that reflexivity. And, and that is not what we're looking for. We're not just looking for, this is a study that's been done in qualitative methods. Um, so that does not meet the threshold that, that uh, for the objects of the journal. Um, and I do think that, that those who are, are testing the waters of qualitative research neglect to understand sort of the ontological, epistemological, as what, as what Raza was saying, the philosophical orientation that allowed you to arrive at a, at a qualitative method that would have infused the theory and the reflexivity into the work to achieve um, that criticality. So something to consider uh, when submitting. Thank you. May I also just add one thing there that, I mean, yeah. 
absolutely agree with the richness and the um, engagement with this with this question, which is quite polemical. I quite enjoy that. But I mean, thinking also about the importance of lived experiences and specifically how feminisms of color have used the personal, I mean, the personal as the political to, uh, you know, shed light on what takes place on both sides of state power as institutionalized in research uh, institutions and uh, the lived experiences that we embody, right? And experience on a, on a daily basis. And I think there is something also to be said about the richness and importance of the singularity of lived experiences. Um, and to um, and, and just to echo, I think everything that that my colleagues have said here, uh, to do that with intention, an intentionality and a uh, commitment to a philosophical project, is really what I think is um, a hugely important and rich part of 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 working with lived experiences and autoethnography and all of those kinds of qualitative post-positivist methodologies that that really do um, speak to how that personal experiences is fundamentally part of how we make the world up. Okay, I think, thank you, Sadvi. And I think that leads, um, all the comments lead in, I'm skipping over a couple of the questions here and we'll go back to them. But um, there is a question further down that I think ties in with this from Marco. In quantitative research, I'll read it for you, the sample size seems to be quite clear and standardized. In qualitative research, however, there is a huge debate, different perspectives on what is a solid sample size. Could you please elaborate further and share your own expectations on this matter? Many thanks. So I think that ties in nicely with the previous question. Um, who wants to start off with that one? I can do that uh, very quickly. Uh, sample size is uh, an immaterial concept. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, one of uh, the more outrageous comments that I had uh, received when I first submitted an ethnography was that you're generalizing from a sample size of one. So uh, clearly people do not understand uh, various uh, traditions and how they operate. Uh, if you are engaging in autoethnography or if you're engaging in any ethnographic practice, then you have, uh, you know, you, you sample size is an immaterial concept. And uh, basically, uh, if you're doing any qualitative research, it is up to you as a researcher to figure out at what point in time you have received enough data and then to justify it through your analysis of the data, through whatever. Uh, uh, modes that you use. So I won't worry about it too much. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Raza. Okay, I think we should move on to, and I see the questions are, are um, coming in well, so we've got limited time. So I'll go with this one um, from Karina, who is struggling with two major unresolved challenges during the writing process of her I assume it's her PhD, I could be incorrect on that. And she's looking forward to hearing our thoughts on it. So hang on, it just disappeared. Publications in the field of entrepreneurship and diversity slash intersectionality, her area of research, emphasized generally in the theoretical embeddedness and contributions. So my impression is that the focus on theory limits creative and in-depth discussion of critical issues. The same holds true for the use of established methodology. So how does Karina know that when leaving known paths of methodology and theory, her work is going to be acceptable for publication? Very interesting question. How are we going to answer Karina? I have, I have some suggestions. Um, no, I thought this was in, in your area. Oh, <laughs> well, I better know the answer. Um, I, I was really thinking in terms of um, how, 
writing as a feminist scholar in the context of management and organizational studies can be a bit of a frustrating exercise because management and organizational studies is very far behind other social sciences in terms of the discourse, in terms of the applications of methods, in terms of the um, just the nature of, of writing itself. And, and though there are growing traditions of writing differently and expressing a feminist position growing in, in management and organizational studies, and it's, it's actually a really strong and vibrant um, area of growth, I have found when I've written for other other journals outside of management and organizational studies, they will push me to say, well, in our discipline, you, the, the discourse is further and you should be referencing this, this, and this. So my lesson here is, is, is push out your references um, to outside of management and organizational literature to find applications of theory and methodology um, that might serve you, that you can then port into um, for the discovery uh, within management and organizational studies. Hopefully that's what you were thinking I was going to say, Jean. <laughs> if not, please. It was. I was thinking of you specifically. Okay. Any other comments on that? Or shall we move on? I would, um, I was just a quick comment, uh, Jean. I was going to say, actually, QRAM, I think, is, is a really good place to try some of that pushing boundaries and um, explore lesser known or, or new uh, ways of working with theory and methodology. So um, I guess my advice would be, you know, just, just choose some good avenues and QRAM could be, could be an example of one of those because working with a journal and the reviewers um, responding to their comments will, would give you really good signposts about, um, you know, whether you're making your case in this new area and, and uh, how it lines up with publication. Hey, thanks, Amy. Now, Mark. Sorry, yes. But David has his hand up. Oh, sorry, I didn't see. The, I'm so busy looking over in the Q and A, I didn't see the hand. Yes, David. Sorry. But we. Thank you. Thank you, Albert and Jean. I, I just wanted to say that that uh, it's useful to look at an article you're writing as as having its own story, which is to say when you write it in its initial form, you will get various forms of reaction. You will get some rejections, perhaps. You will improve it, and it will have a life, and the life will be really interesting in retrospect. It might take six months to be published. It might take 20 or 30 years. Of course, you could should be working on multiple things simultaneously, something in the oven, something on, something on the dining room table, but uh, the fact that it has a long story isn't a bad thing. It's actually, you know, you're in a kind of struggle in which you're communicating and convincing people and you're both learning. So it's a positive thing. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, David. Um, Mark has uh, an interesting question, which I haven't thought about. Um, He's interested to know how we at the journal are planning to respond to the forthcoming challenges in the post pandemic era and the existential threat of climate change. So I would say we, the short answer in Albert's screening, I think the short answer is we're always open to special issues. And uh, I think that that might be, or I don't think, I know that that would be a very interesting topic to bring forward. So. Um, if you're interested in, in talking more about this, get in touch with us, Mark, by all means. I think that's a very important. I'm waiting for post-pandemic. I'm still waiting for the post part to, to hit us. So yeah, definitely interesting. Albert, did you want to add to that? No, no, I think that's, I mean, we know we're probably going to be inundated, not Curon, but all the journals with some articles on on the pandemic and it actually, I don't have to convince anybody here, it, it opens so many interesting novel ways of looking at the world that we used to live in. So we just need good, good proposal for a special issue, for example. Okay. Um, in can the interest, just, sorry, yeah, can I just add, um, 
Sure. I think this is a really important question because um, it's actually talking about, well, identifying two interlocking viruses, if you like, or two interlocking mm -hmm. crises. But I, you know, we do need to, I think, be cognizant of the multiple interlocking crises uh, of our times, including um, the intensification of uh, racial capitalism, um, the uh, Black Lives Matter movement, um, alongside the real threat uh, to um, critical theory, right? In, and, and how that's looking for, for folks working as academics and trained intellectuals. And I think methodologically, actually, it is perhaps one of the most crucial sort of questions is to see how do we methodologically investigate the interlocking of these uh, 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 crises as they come together, rather than focusing on one, right? But rather to see these as what's happening, as how do we make sense of it? How do we sort of even try to um, curate some kind of framework to make sense of this? Um, I think that is actually a really important thing that um, I think in methodological terms is, is, is important to look at. Oh, that was fantastic. Pitapi. Amazing. Great. Thank you for that. Wow. Okay. I Makes think me want to run out and do it. <laughs> yes. Yeah. We have time for one more, <coughs> one more question, um, which is good because that's what we have in the Q&A box here. So what are some ways um, in which you have analyzed across levels of analysis. I don't, I'm reading the question, I don't know who can see it, but like micro identities, emotions and interactions, meso organizational level and macro society phenomena. How does one write about these dynamics in your data in a coherent way? Also, what are your thoughts on grounded theory? I've read that it's positivist, quasi-positivist, so I've been exploring critical phenomenology and uh, CDA, but our field really loves GT for qualitative research. Who wants to start on that one? Amy, I'm, I'm not pointing the finger at you, but I'm thinking that this might be first part, at least relatable. Uh, yeah, well, I, I feel like, um... And I'm just, you know, just my opinion. I, I've always thought of grounded theory more in the qualitative camp than the positivist uh, camp. Although, you know, really, and I think one of the, one of the other panelists mentioned, like, I, I think it's, um, it, it's challenging to divide qualitative and quantitative into two polar um, areas of research and, and look at the world in sort of those two camps. I think it's much more useful to look at methodologies sort of in generally, generally speaking, in relation to how they can help you investigate the question that you want to explore. And so um, from that perspective, grounded theory, I think, has great potential to investigate particular questions. Um, I think has a you know good opportunity to get to some of the um, intersectional issues or perhaps the interdisciplinary um, boundaries that we were talking about um, because the nature of it requires the investigator to let go of assumptions that you might have previously held about the question you're investigating. So um, that was a long sentence, but <laughs> I, I guess that's that's my advice. Is instead of saying you know am I in the right camp. Uh, think more about the question you're asking and if the question is is a critical question you know uh, has a critical perspective and if it's interested in you know sort of the nuanced understanding of how humans interact or or why something's happened as opposed to you know counting how often it happens then i'd say you know uh, the method that can do that is is going to be qualitative yeah I think, um, what do I think? I think that some approaches, methodologies have been, if not labeled, characterized by uh, positivism in, in general. And it, 
it puts you off as a qualitative researcher thinking, oh, this is just positivism. The same with case study research. I remember people doing case study research and people responding like, oh, you're doing that? Oh my God, that's positivist. Or grounded theory, oh my God, that's positivist. I think the characterization is in our hands. Uh, I did that encyclopedia of case study research to reclaim case study research for a broader qualitative audience. And grounded theory always struck me as very sensible, but I didn't like the sort of first iterations of it. So, but when Chavez came in to join, to engage with that, I think she pushed it a bit more to the sort of phenomenological side. So I think to whoever wrote this question, just go for it, make it your own. It, it, nobody owns it. Uh, you you define it. I mean, in sensible, plausible ways, and you know, don't don't be. It's another one of those barriers that we've got to overcome. Okay, so there is one more question, which we are now over time, and I'll throw it out there so we can quickly answer it because I think it's important. Um, what does critical theory even mean? That could be a whole other session. So we'll, we'll put it out there. I don't know, does anyone want to try to answer that in one minute or less? I don't think it can be done. I think we'd get um, as many answers as people. Right. I think it means something different, but I think it's important to remember that it looks at the uh, in the broadest sense, looking at uh, the impact on individuals in organizations, and that's a very simple term. So I think we will say that that's the end of the question session for this. And again, we, we thank everyone, especially all our participants, the panel, the audience, and uh, Thank you so much for giving us the time to, to explain our journal. And it was so good to see everyone. Good to see you. Yeah, wonderful. Yes. So perhaps you. You could, we could tell the participants that we'd be happy to receive email questions from them and they can find our email addresses on the QROM website. So if there was someone here who's spoken and you thought they might be able to answer a question you had and you weren't comfortable putting it out to the whole group, then feel free to, to do so. Definitely. Do so. Definitely. All right. So thank you. Oh, here's Alex. Thank you very much. Wow, what a discussion. I mean, every question could be an hour in its own right. Um, uh, thank you so much. I've, um, it's been, I've really enjoyed listening to um, to you talk about everything, including the critical theory for a bit. Um, so um, yes, so um, this comes to, this event sadly comes to an end now, uh, but we hope uh, to see to see you soon in our ne next event, which is going to be our next event. Which, oh, sorry, uh, can you hear me all right? Because I'm getting a bit of an echo. Can hear you. Yes, we can hear you, Alex, yes. Great, okay. Uh, the event is not, um, the event is going to be on the 6th of October and it's going to be another event in our publishing critical work uh, series and this time it will be with culture and organization which is I'm sure is going to be a fantastic discussion again. Um, so yes do do keep in touch with us we are um, welcoming proposals for webinars and other events so if you have an idea in mind to organize your own event please get in touch. Um, but via email or Twitter with us, and we're always, um, you know, very keen to hear from from you and your ideas. Uh, and in the meantime, do follow us on Eventbrite, um, where you can register for our events um, on YouTube and uh, on Twitter as well. So um, I would like to say a big thank you again to um, Jane and Albert and everyone else. I'm sorry, I'm not going to remember every single name because there are so many people on the panel, but uh, thank you so much everyone for joining in and making it a special 
uh, special PDW. Uh, and thank you also um, to the Intouch team behind the scenes. Um, there's a lot of activity uh, going on. So, and very excitedly, we have new CMS Intouch team members behind the scenes today. Uh, so thank you very much, um, everyone. And um, take care until we we'll look forward to see you soon. And take care and stay safe in the meantime. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye, thank you.